What is up, everybody? Thank you so much for coming back week after week. Today's guest, so excited, is a well-known podcaster, especially in this space, and those who have been following alternative explanations for the conditions and events in our world, Greg Carlwood and the Higher Side Chats would be something that you already know about, but let me just do an intro for him anyway. Greg Carlwood started the Higher Side Chats, or THC for short, in 2010 after moving to the West Coast to try his hand at cannabis cultivation and distribution, and he was working at GameStop at the time. This is all on his website. Uh, before THC became his number one gig, and it took a few years, but now his podcast is the number one conspiracy show that I personally listen to and is one of the tippy tops in this genre. And this brings us up to the present. I was just recently on the Higher Side Chats for the first time, and I decided to turn the tables and interview the interviewer. And that's why we're all here. So let's just get it on on the Ben Stewart podcast. <laughs> Ahoy. Ahoy. All right. Hey, we thanks are... for having me. Yeah, man. Excited to have you. This is the, I could say it's been a long time coming, but, you know, even before we got me on your show, I know you were reaching out to me for quite some time. Um, sure. Been loving your show, dude, for quite some time. Actually, I think the, uh, we won't have to get into it now, but I think the very first show of yours that I saw was the one you did with Jan Irving. Oh, no. That was an interesting one. Yeah. What a way to start. But, you know, the interesting thing is, is like, I've always kind of felt that he wasn't human and he was a gremlin anyway. And this just confirmed my my preconceived notions. So, um, but anyway, with that, man, really amazing show. I'm super glad you could grace us. There's, there's some pretty cool uh, topics we can tread. And the first thing I want to know is really just kind of something more as like you were working at GameStop. And there was this certain point that I read in your bio where you realized, uh, I think your your boss had come and said maybe your performance was slipping a little bit. And you were just like, yeah, that's because I got this side hustle maybe just in your head. But that's that's maybe the impetus where you realized, OK, I think it's time for me to take this podcasting thing a bit more seriously. And I remember you said in, in, that, in, or in that bio of yours that uh, you thought the podcasting space was super saturated at the point. Um, I would love to know your thoughts of like taking that leap and actually just doing something that you believed in. Cause I'll just throw one more tidbit out there. You did something on shroom fest and yeah. you, you realize, even though that was super cool, what, what you were doing, you realize that nah, you know what, like, you know, the deeper I investigate this, it's, it's not actually where I want the higher side chats to go. And that's, you know, sometimes a scary moment, but also sometimes brings a lot of clarity. I would love to know what that time period was like where you were just like, you know what, I'm, I'm balls deep in this venture. Yeah, man, knowledgeable, quite knowledgeable. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, a lot of the background of my story, but yeah, the Shroom Fest element, Ari Shafir, comedian, friend of Joe Rogan's, he started doing this thing where he wanted to do 420 for mushrooms. So I think it was 620 was the date and he was everybody's everybody's gonna do mushrooms and just celebrate being on them and he was coming down to san diego to the comedy store condo because there's two comedy stores one in la one down here and they have a condo where comics who are coming down for the weekend stay for free so sometimes they use it for other things as well and i got invited to come down there and, and hang out and do mushrooms and I did, and my now wife was with me at the time, and I started to have a kind of a bad trip in the sense that I was just picking up on on stuff where I was kind of with some local comics who were trying to elbow their way into the mid-level of uh, comedian fame, and then here I am, who's never done stage time, just doing the podcast, and the guys that Ari was with, I could see them look at each other and give a look and then start laughing. Like, what are these people doing here? Because, you know, I think we've all been on the other side of that from time mm -hmm. to time. So I was like, just feeling really self-conscious, feeling like a poser. The mushrooms really told me like, this isn't where you want to be. You're not going to do a comedy podcast. I still was kind of on the line. I was trying to talk to comedians about conspiratorial stuff and they just didn't have the knowledge base. So it wasn't really clicking 
And the mushrooms were like, you know, dude, just get out of here. And I left and I just wouldn't say it was a breakdown, but a breakdown slash epiphany. And I just kind of was going on and on to my wife. Like that was the last time I do anything related to comedy in that way. It's just, that's not where I'm going. I'm going to go hard into what I want to do and stop trying to take the conspiracy stuff and glob on to the popularity of cons- of comedy podcasts and try to blend it and just drop that part of it and, and go full on conspiracy. And I asked Michael Tassarion for an interview. It happened really smoothly and easily. And that's when I knew, you know, this is the path. And mm. thankfully it was. And I've got a lot of compounds to thank for a lot of different things. If it wasn't for ecstasy, me and my wife probably never would have gone from really good friends to now married. We just weren't going to put ourselves out there and broach that aspect of things. And if it weren't for that mushroom trip, I might have just quit the podcast or kept trying to stumble into comedy somehow. And I've just been really lucky. And Salvia, if it wasn't for Salvia, I wouldn't have seen a glimpse behind the curtain of reality. So I think these things are so great and they obviously overlap with the material that you get into, but that is the, the shroom fest thing and the GameStop thing. I actually had a pretty good relationship with my direct boss, which is the only reason I could stomach a lot of the retail jobs I've had. I've actually been really lucky that I've always had a good relationship with my direct read, like the regional manager. And they always were a good buffer between the corporate side of things and the corporate messaging and then just me how I am. And so out of respect for them, I'd get the job done. But towards the end of GameStop, it was like things were just getting really busy with the show. I actually lost a couple of interviews because I had to work. I got called in and I was like, wow, I guess I'm not going to interview Gary Johnson, who's running as the presidential nominee of the Libertarian Party. That would have been a good one, but I guess I got to run the store. And it was just like the audience was getting big. I knew it was working and my boss was like, your performance is slipping, man. I feel like I can be honest with you, but like, you know, you really got to pick it up. And I was like, actually, I'm going to just set it down entirely. And I think I'm just going to do the show. Luckily, my my wife was really supportive of that and we figured we'd make it work. And I tried to do it on like a donation basis. I did this thing called the Money Bomb. I don't think any other podcast has done it, but I would take half the donations I get and I keep half and I gift half back to a random listener who donated kind of like a 50 50 Mm. raffle when Mm -hmm. i realized it was international gambling on the internet i kind of shut it down because it's probably (laughs) not wise um but you know then i transitioned into the first hour free the second hour for subscribers well before patreon existed and that has been my bread and butter i'm very fortunate but thank uh, you know praise be to the compounds for (laughs) putting me on the right path from time to time I was just going to say, man, those those compounds, what's interesting is I've told this story. Um, I can't even remember if I maybe I told it on your show, but like what got me to become a filmmaker from a musician, I was a musician at the time, was I saw the film Zeitgeist mm-hmm. on either Mushrooms or LSD. And it what it did was it, it caused me to, to see... The, something more inspirational than just scary. And also I think what helped was that was a film that was done with some artistry. It had a good soundtrack. It was well edited. It it didn't look like one of those grandma's basements type of film. It actually looked well done. It was free and it didn't even have, um, it didn't even have Peter Joseph's name on it at first. It just had a website at the end. And it did this thing where I was like, I, I felt the gift of it. it. It almost felt like, I don't want you to know who I am. Don't even give me any money. This is free. I just want you to wake up so I could feel the sincerity of it. And maybe I felt it deeper because of those compounds. And I'm I'm curious, like, what were the compounds that you had gotten into at, like, what age did that, did that start? And was there one defining period that helped kind of define your work with the you know the plants or the compounds (laughs) well i actually was quite lame in high school i was completely sober until i was 21 and uh then 
I was playing poker with some buddies I'd had forever. And I was like, if I win this poker game, I'll do a shot with you guys for each 10 bucks I win. And I won 60 bucks. Six shots later, I'm like, this is what you guys have been doing, you know, for years. And they really <laughs> couldn't believe that I was like diving into it. But we were away from home, uh, away at college, you know, buddy's apartment. It's like, this is a safe environment. And I'm just like, I'm always on the outside of this thing. Why don't I just dive in? And so obviously after that, my friends were like, you know, weed is really your speed. You know, drinking's fine. Have a few beers with us, but you're really going to like this weed thing. And of course, they were not wrong. And it just opened me up to maybe these things won't ruin your life, like I was told. And maybe there is a way to use them sparingly or enjoy them from time to time and take the edge off and get yourself into a different frame of mind that might make you more creative or see things in a different way. And I'm thankful for it. But yeah, they they had an impact for sure. And every one I've done, like just the particular substances has had that pivotal moment in a very important slice of the pie of life. And uh, I just was late to the party, honestly. <laughs> that's that's cool, though. I mean, like it it also shows that like they're, you know, it it didn't have to come like for me, I, I started mushrooms at age 14, Ooh. you know, and it wasn't until I was 24 that I went to the Amazon and did ayahuasca ceremonially. Mm. So that was like the first time that I actually had like a, an indigenous container surrounding the experience. And like, it was incredible to me how much that changed the experience itself. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's funny that you mention it just because of the time period that we're living in. And I know that you you cover this. And um, I think on our uh, our podcast, you were like, this is going to be a nice deviation from what I've been talking about a lot on my show. But it's this idea, you know, I'm going to segue from what's going on with the, the, the world today into the topic that we were just on about, like psychedelics and exploration of consciousness, because you know, ayahuasca is great. Mushrooms are great. MDMA is great. They they have their things you need to be wary of. But what's interesting is if you really look at it, if we are like, if we have the capacity to be far more mature than we typically look at, you know, average Americans, then you could start seeing that it's really just not even self-medicating, but it's like self-modulating. Like when you need to take the edge off, you you know the kind of compound you want to work with. And for me, what I noticed was there, all my friends were getting into opiates and things along those lines. And mm. by the time that I found psychedelics, I was like, opiates are not for me. Like they seem to do this to your consciousness when psychedelics seem to open you up. And there was just something that I felt. It was almost like, the same thing that I felt when it came to conspiracy, because when I saw conspiracy, I wasn't like, oh, no, oh, no, this looks like it's coming and it's coming straight for us. And I wasn't like that at all. I was like, wow, there's so much more to learn about mm -hmm. the world and I can start doing it now. I can start. Lo I remember that night I didn't sleep at all. I just started researching nonstop and that was fueled by the psychedelic for sure. Um, but I want to know, like when you what was the the thing that got you aware maybe you were aware of conspiracy beforehand but what what clicked what was the moment where it actually clicked for you and what did that feel like finally realizing like oh that's what this whole field of you know investigation is all about well it was comedians like bill hicks and george carlin that really were the first ones to be like damn that guy just articulated what i've thought about for a long time in the perfect way. And both Terrence McKenna, well, Bill Hicks mentioned Terrence McKenna, and then I went down the Terrence McKenna rabbit hole, and George Carlin mentioned Robert Anton Wilson, and then I went down that rabbit hole. And so just those four people, I feel like, are so insightful. And originally, it was always about like the Rockefeller, Rothschild, debt-based system of rule and the slave job and working the nine to five and the soul sucking work you do. And then the midlife crisis is when you finally wake up and realize you were sold a lie. You were going to climb the ladder to the top and they gave you somewhere in the middle and said, be happy with that or get out. And you can't get your time back. You can't uninvest all those years in a company. So 
for me, a lot of it was that because I was dealing with retail. I was dealing with the fact that I dropped out of college. So I really whittled away my options. I grew up in Missouri, not a lot of places to work. So the local mall is where we go. And when I was 20, it was pretty interesting that somebody would trust me with the keys to their business. When I was 30, everybody else was starting to pass me by and I was still working in a mall with 17 year olds because that's who works at the mall. <laughs> and I used that opportunity to obviously, the only good thing about working at a corporate store is they have stores everywhere. So I could be broke in San Diego if I was gonna be broke in St. Louis. So I just used that network to move out. But I think one thing that was like kind of a wake up call along those lines was once I did kind of make it, I, I guess I just lost this attitude of, oh, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, they're out to get me. They're out to suppress me. And it's like, actually, they really don't care. They've set up a overlay, a systemic thing that kind of keeps pressure on people. But if you have the balls to dive in and do something of your own, you can be successful. You you can get paid what you're worth, what the market decides you might be worth, and they don't even know about it. They don't have anything to say about it. So it was kind of freeing to be like, actually, a lot of this is is broad and and systemic and somewhat hypothetical. And if you can graduate from it, which is why I liked your film so much back in the day, is like the the whole esoteric aspect to it. You hear people say, well, the earth is a soul school. Well, what is one of the first lessons you can learn is you can kind of graduate from that Rockefeller Rothschild debt-based system of rule and giving your life away to some shitty company. And then you can do your own thing. And it's like, wow, all it took was some balls. And Terrence mm -hmm. McKenna's line, um, something to the effect of, you should throw yourself, hurl yourself into the abyss and you'll realize that it's a feather bed. You know, basically nature respects boldness. And if you act boldly, instead of this meek, mild, weak kind of stuff we do because we're afraid, we don't switch jobs because we're afraid, well, what if it's worse? Or, you know, what if I can't pay my bills? And those aren't real concerns, but you got to dive into the deep end of the pool of life and have some adventure. And I think that that's kind of the positive side of conspiracy to me is it pre presented me a roadmap, kind of a better, more accurate roadmap not this white picket fence suburban life where you just keep your job and suck up to the boss. But it's like, if that's the lie we've been sold, you know, having that built into your accurate roadmap, it's scary because ignorance is bliss. It's nice to just be a retail manager and not have to think about these things. But once you've woken up, you can't be happy like that. So, no. you know, you got to dive in. And I think the, that was kind of the real, the most awakening thing for me, if I'm not going to use a 9-11 example, is just realizing, oh, uh, these things are all true, but at the same time, you can navigate around them, and they're, you know, the Rockefellers aren't going to come knocking on your door and say, "Get back to GameStop." No, no, it's funny. Um, there's a, a bunch of things that come up for me in that, and definitely taking the leap, man. For me, mm -hmm. um, I remember I was trying to make it as a musician. And I was in this band for quite some time. We were touring nonstop. And I just happened to make these films because people were asking, what are the lyrics about? And so I made these films not thinking anything of it, not really knowing where they could go or, or what might happen to them. I just did it. And by the end, I was almost done with Esoteric Agenda when I realized you know, th this person was asking to buy a thousand copies of the DVD once I finish it. <laughs> and, and I was thinking like, okay, if I finish this film, exactly as it is, then it's just a conspiracy film. So I decided to, to switch. It was the last 15 minutes of the film that was all about human potential. It was all trying to inspire people again and give that kind of plot twist. Like, I know all of this seems so magnificently huge, but if it's really, it's just taking out all the 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 logical ways the a to b ways we think we need to operate in this world where we are the you know the, the diminished low potential creatures and like you said it's really just taking the leap and being like well like what happens if i do stick my neck out and i do what i think i need to do and for me i had no idea it was going to turn into a film career 
And it it really did reward itself. And I also gave the film away for free. I remember my parents being like, Ben, 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 like, I know you didn't go to economics or, you know, or anything like that, but like, this is not the way to get ahead. And sure enough, it's what got Gaia's attention to to bring me to Gaia and become a, a producer there for a couple of years. Those original films, they still get me interviews today. There's something about them that by the, the um, the gifting nature of it by just saying, you know what, this is for humanity because I too, I just want people to wake up. And I even went the uh, at the very beginning, the um, anonymous route. But the interesting thing, I'm thinking back to those days and there's something really curious about the, the kinds of information that you, and the kinds of like websites where you could read about conspiracy back then and today. And it's like, you know, Aladdin was right. It's a whole new world. <laughs> Today is a completely different world of research. And what's funny is like, I almost miss the old days where it was like, it was a Rothschild or it was a Rockefeller and it had to do with banking schemes because I kind of feel like conspiracies kind of like went too micro-focused and, and then they just started getting altered from the original ideas of where this all came from. And I'm curious, like your perceptions like how have they changed and how you research these things since when you started looking them up to now, like how has the internet changed? Like how, how is it, is it easier for you now to find what you're looking for or is it, is it kind of more like niche? Like all these new things come up, the, you know, the flat earth thing, the Q thing, those are the two most like they got the biggest PR came campaigns behind it, but there was like a lot of splintering off of it. Like, you know, what to me, or to you, what was that like researching in the early days as opposed to now? Well, I love the old internet of angel fire flash websites and your buddy gives you a link and you got to go directly to that link and you read this whole rabbit hole about John Monet Ramsey or some shit. <laughs> and I loved that. I really did. You had to know where to go. It was like a club. It had to be handed to you or presented to you. And there was no real search engines. And even though there, I guess there were, but people didn't really know how to use them. Now it's all we use. And it's all just yeah. been corporatized, which is unfortunate. But at the same time, conspiracy has been monetized. And a lot of people have decided to... It, what bothers me is when people just try to be extreme, like, oh, I got this new idea and here it is. And it's the most extreme thing. And they might not even believe it. And they mm -hmm. might have doctored an image to to yeah. get this ball rolling or something. And that happens so much. And it is harder to find what you're looking for because it's harder to to keep up. It's you got Google and the censorship cabal coming down on one end. And then you got the people who are muddy in the waters on the other end. Yeah. And so it does get really difficult. I know we talked about the flat earth and QAnon off air a little bit, but when I started the show, I was always like, I'll talk about anything. I'll go as extreme as anyone will, and no topic is too taboo for me. And I still agree with that. Nothing's too taboo. Like, nothing's too uncomfortable or thorny that I won't at least discuss it. But Flat Earth came out and QAnon came out, and it was like, I feel like this has been weaponized against us to, to yeah. go into, you know, false rabbit holes. And I don't like that. And it was a weird position to be like, I guess I'm not the most extreme person in the room anymore. <laughs> there are people who are going way further with this than me. And so now I feel like a conspiracy centralist, which is really odd. Uh, maybe that's part of growing up. Maybe it's part of feeling a sense of responsibility to get at the truth and not just the most provocative thing. Yeah. Even though sometimes yeah. there's a lot of overlap there. You know, anything I say... You can look at my catalog and be like, well, what about this one, dude? You know, and I'll sound like a hypocrite, but it is what it is. I, I still love some of the the wild stuff about hidden history, huge mm -hmm. chapters of history being missing, the mud flood, as we discussed. By the way, you know, you on my show, people just love that interview. I've gotten so much good feedback about it. It was a real cornucopia of conspiracy goodness. We talked about so many things and I think people who have been looking at conspiracy material on the internet for well over a decade, almost two, yeah, we're going to be able to talk about some stuff, but it was really great. People loved it. 
Uh, and I, I I do agree. It's just it's a little harder to find what you're looking for now because what do you do? You go to the conspiracy subreddit. Well, that's kind of heavily monitored. And I guess nothing's really stopping you from going to individual websites like we did back in the day. But I guess because of work now, I just find books and I dive into that particular book. And uh, I'm always just trying to get those five shows out a month. And it's getting harder to keep up with all the, the feedback and just keep the the show the empire going mm -hmm. it's hard for me to enjoy psychedelics anymore actually every time i get into a psychedelic space i just feel this pressure of like dude what if your website goes down right now and you're not prepared to contact your it guy and get it back online and it just feels like there there is a pressure to my job that doesn't exist when you just clock in and clock out yeah and i'm super happy for my position but at the same time there's a give and a take with everything and so I just haven't been able to enjoy psychedelics for quite some time for that reason. I just feel like I always got to be kind of with it. <laughs> I feel you. Well, I mean, being a parent, I never find that the too. time. Never find the time because, I mean, for the same reason, you know, like something could go wrong and you're not in the space to handle it. Um, but it's even like, I don't know, kid energy is great, but like, you know, there, there's something about being slightly altered and looking at your kid, I, I, even sometimes with pets. Have you ever had that where you look at a pet and you're like, oh my God, this cat knows exactly yeah. what's going on inside me. Well, it's amplify that by a thousand and that's a child. And Absolutely. You know, it brings, what's strange is I wonder if this is from those dare days where there's still elements of shame that was put into me by just saying no, a drug is a drug, even the, the gateway drug, the one that's never killed anybody in the history of ever, um, has only you know brought incredible things except for when people really highly abuse it, which is still probably the safest vice you could ever have. And yes, I'm talking about cannabis. Um, in, in schedule one, where it seemed to be for a while more, di you know, more dangerous by schedule than it was than than cocaine, which I think was schedule two, or or something along those lines. But um, I feel you, man. Like it's really hard to navigate blowing your mind way open when you have so much responsibility and things to do. And and I want to touch base on what you said about like. Over the years, I thought the same thing. Like, man, I will, I will talk about any topic. You give it to me, I will talk about it. But then I think that's the universe listening and being like, okay, but I want you to listen well. And it gave me a few of these things like when like, so Flat Earth came out and I looked at it and I looked at it a lot. And in a way I was just like, you know what? I, I can't be the intellectual genius here and, and talk people under the table because I just haven't done all this math. And there's something in me that's like, I don't care at all about it. Like, it doesn't seem like it's actually going to enrich my life. And I couldn't find a way to articulate that in a way that wouldn't make me sound like a hypocrite for a while um, with the flat earth thing. And like with the Q thing, two of those got so big so quickly that it was a spidey sense in the back of me that was just like, nah, nah, you can't just start something complete BS and have it turn out like this, right? You know, like this, there's some kind of PR campaign behind this that runs deeper than my piggy bank or people's piggy banks that I know of. So something just didn't seem right about them. And I still haven't gotten to the bottom of it, but I think you're, you're, you're kind of, at least on my wavelength with being like a, a centralist where it's like, listen, I'm not just trying to be the way news, a lot of news, I should say, has gone where it's like it's less about the quality of the story and more about how quickly you get it out to people. And if it's m more provocative, even if you're wrong, then all you have to do is retract the statement later. You still got all the clicks. It's still great for the algorithms. And I think there's something in this where it's like, you know, it caused me to soften up on capitalism, economics, and realize that it's just, okay, this is just the way that it's working. There's many holes I could poke in it. There's many things I don't like about it. But in a way, I started getting, and I think we mentioned this, you know, in the early days, there was so much more trolling. And it seemed like in the early days, if I were to accept any money at all for what I was doing, I was a complete sellout. And I was like a, a government shill or a corporate shill or something like that. And it seemed like a lot of animosity back then. 
And I'm curious your thoughts, like, you know, like the, the audience, ha has your audience just gotten more normalized to where they're desensitized to conspiracy and now it's just like, yeah, so it doesn't trigger them so much? Or like, are you finding the same thing where you're not getting like the trolls saying you're going to burn in hell, you know, for, for having a guest on that's talking about something controversial? Well, there's always a little bit of that. People are so... Uh aggressive about their particular points and they don't want to hear other things that may just may conflict with them. You know, if you've made your mind up that the earth is flat and one of my guests who's on to talk about something completely different says, well, you know, they've got troops all around the globe. A person, yeah. you take two hour conversation <laughs> and then you look at the comments and a person's like, this guy's a shill. He mentioned the globe. And it's like, dude, he was here to talk about like esotericism in the Renaissance. You know, yeah. he's, it's just kind of ridiculous sometimes. And you are going to get that. And there are people who don't realize that iTunes reviews are for the show as an in, as in its entirety. And you'll get you'll look at reviews. It'll be like one star. I love this guy. I've been listening to him to him for years. But then he had so and so on. And now I know he, he's just a shill one star and it's like well did you give me five stars for all the shows you did like right i yeah. doubt it no uh, so it happens but i would it, say it happens a surprisingly small amount given the controversial nature we're talking about there was definitely an uptick in it with covid because mm -hmm. you know people didn't want to look at that with a critical lens and people had to confront some some uncomfortable stuff i know there are people in the conspiracy world that talked a strong game and then they really didn't back up what they say because you can find people that say you know never trust the government never trust these corporations the media is lying to you and they're triple vaxxed and it's like yeah. all right dude i thought you didn't trust these people until you get a little scared and then how quickly you change your tune and it's yeah. like were you just trying to be provocative were you just in it because you know you can say some crazy conspiracy shit and get new subscribers. You know, you really, I think COVID was a, a litmus test for, do you have the balls to really stand behind what you said? Do you have the balls to look for truth buried under a mountain of lies? The coordination of the big cabal that we've been criticizing for so long, it, it just seemed like a, a real, another one of those tests. If yeah. this is a school, a soul school, that was another major test. I feel very proud of how I've navigated it and how the guests I've had on have presented their cases and not every every one of them agrees. Again, like I've had some guests on. It's another good example of that. People are so locked into one thing. I would have a guest on who would say viruses aren't even real. And yeah. I would think, well, that's possible. I think it maybe is a little extreme. I'll hold that up in my head with also this might be something manipulated and weaponized because what are these labs doing? Uh, if not, you know, if viruses aren't real. So I can hold two ideas in my head. It's like, well, here's multiple possibilities. But the audience, you know, you present them with this idea and this guess that they really love. Viruses aren't real. I'm on that page now. And then three weeks later, you have a guest who wants to talk about it from a weaponization angle. And now that person who you enlightened to the very perspective they're now latched onto is mad that you're talking about it from another angle. It's kind of frustrating, but- Oh, that's you're talking the... my language, man. Dude, like <laughs> in 2009, no one was talking about Flat Earth. I can't say that. It does go back earlier than that. But as far as I was looking into the weirdest shit you know, that explains what's going on in the world. Never heard of the flat earth idea until at least years after Chimatica. But I had, uh, you know, several people hit me up and say, I used to love Chimatica. It was my favorite movie in the world. But now I realize, again, you're a shill for the, the globe earth cabal because you never once mentioned in that film about flat earth. And I would respond back sometimes and be like, dude, that wasn't even a thing back in 2009. And you didn't even ask, have I updated my beliefs? And then they would, and I would say no, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but like, you know, the interesting thing about that was like how, I, I will say this, I do have some extremely intelligent friends that they, they not only believe 
in the flat earth, but they speak about it in a way that I'm like, you know what? I could chill with you. I could hang mm-hmm. out with you because it's not all about you need to believe what I believe or else you are an idiot. You are like the worst kind of idiot. I have people where it's just like, yeah, I mean, yeah, look at this. I, I just posted this today when my, my lower self steps out of line and my higher self comes in to reaffirm my mission on this planet and why I'm here, which is basically the higher self saying to the lower self, you cannot uplift humanity and call them fucking idiots at the same time. <laughs> Fair point. And what's, yeah, it's, I mean, like, I mean, that's that's kind of how I feel. There's There's something, there's something about the amount of anger you get from people who are so deeply invested in a belief that they picked up from the internet. That's really, when you break it down, it doesn't matter what you believe. It's something that you didn't witness with your own eyes. It's, it did the right channel give me the information because that's what I will believe as the bedrock of reality. And if you don't, I'm so mad about it, you mm-hmm. know? And f- I've had to raise myself up from like attacking back at these people, which is really the school of life. You know, the, these individuals have helped me practice what I preach. And that is, I can see beneath their angry words that they're suffering and that they don't get what's happening in the world. There's a, there's a, a huge gap between their concept of reality and, um, and what they're actually witnessing out there in the world. Yeah, I agree with you. And I like to try to find common ground with basically anyone I can, including the flat earthers, because I like to say, hey, we are on the same page 99% Mm -hmm. of the way. You know, can we just celebrate that? Because it is so hard to find people who think that the world is a carefully crafted manipulation and, you know, don't trust anything you see and all that kind of stuff. And then we just go to this one place where we kind of disagree and it's not even about their conclusion. We talked about this on, on my show, but if you watch these flat earth documentaries, they will present different images of the earth that have been presented to us from NASA that say, these are official images. And you look at them side by side and there's no way those are pictures of the same thing. So mm-hmm. what's the easy answer? Well, they're composites and they're a bunch of images stitched together. And when you do that in the seventies and then do it 15 years later in 1985, then they're not going to look exactly right. Okay, well, you told us these were image, these were pictures of the Earth. You told us this was the blue marble from space. You mm-hmm. presented it as if you took a camera, snapped it, and that's the Earth. Well, then why does it look so radically different? Why do the land masses and these other images, the, the shorelines don't match at all? The size of North America doesn't match at all. You know, you're lying about something, and... I think that there's a lot of esotericism in NASA and a lot Mm -hmm. of Freemasonic references and symbolic references, calling things Osiris Rex and Apollo and the logos they use. And you start to unpack that. You're like, is any of this real? Is this whole organization, which came out of military intelligence, is it real? I just saw uh, on a random YouTube clip I was watching the other day, it was something on mainstream news, and they said they have an astronaut crisis, that NASA is having a hard time ha- getting astronauts, and that there's only 44. I don't know exactly how much stock to put in that, but how many NASA astronauts are there? And mm-hmm. what kind of education do they have to get? And what do they have to agree to to get to those positions? And mm-hmm. do they ever go anywhere? And can we get through the Van Allen radiation belt? I definitely don't think we went to the moon. I'll give flat earthers that. We did not go in this tin can to the moon and back before they invented the mouse and keyboard. And you're going to tell me that they steered this thing from uh, Texas? Well, isn't the earth spinning? Like, aren't we rotating and spinning at thousands of miles an hour? The moon's out there spinning. Isn't it like trying to, like swoosh a golf ball into the hole on a par five. I mean, it seems pretty freaking difficult. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So with flat earthers, I'm on their page that we have been lied to a lot. I just don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that, well, I have to go completely 180 the other way and the earth is flat. Although they also have some interesting data about flight paths and, and yeah, all kinds of stuff. So I'm interested in it, but I just think that what what where I 
can't get into it is there's not a good explanation for the sun and moon. There's not really a great explanation for outer space and what stars are. I guess there isn't a good explanation in either paradigm, but I can't just call the sun and moon the, the luminaries and say God did it, and we're just in a snow globe. I don't know. That just doesn't seem any more compelling than the Big Bang to me. But, you know, that angle no. that they, the angle that they're hiding, that they had to go to these extent, like if they are Satanists, the idea that they had to go to this extent to craft a worldview that got us away from God and got us to adopt atheism. Because if this is God's playground, God's sandbox, and it is a flat earth paradigm, there's no denying it. There's no way you can like look around and be like, God didn't make this place because it may, it would make no sense this mm-hmm. flat plane and looking at everything. But when they go all the way out of their way and they're like, oh no, the big bang and galaxies and trillions of stars and space and everything's just chaotic random randomness, then that is how you get to atheism. If you're playing a long game and your goal is to get people to deny the creator, you have to do all that. You have to recontextualize this entire human terrarium into what it would be in this random, cold, dead, meat suit, materialist universe to get there. And I like that idea. I like that that's what flat earthers believe, that this is part of the charade, this matrix crafted around us. It's kind of fun. It is, man. And it, it gets you into some like deeper territories. What I like about it, you know, is I don't I don't feel the need to wear a badge just yet. Like, I believe this and I believe it firmly. There's a couple things that I absolutely believe pretty firmly, but I haven't shut the book on on many of these ideas. I mean, like, you know, so like I also find like I can talk about wormholes in the DNA and how ancient, um, not even so ancient Native Americans probably knew the technology of stargates, not just physical spots on planet Earth, but within them to be able to travel the cosmos. And some of their ancestors were actually star people. So I can talk about some pretty weird shit. Yeah. But, you know, like the thing is, is there's a romantic element to it because you know, when I hear there's certain, I forget the guy's name. I wish I could remember it, but it was someone doing a flat earth, um, uh, podcast somewhere and was mentioning these rounds of humanity and drawing back upon Madame Helena Blavatsky about like different rounds of humanity and how the sun isn't our only sun. And it comes up, you know, so you, Anyone listening, you have to understand that the the at least the current model for flat Earth is think of a record player. The South Pole is a rim around the outside. The middle dot is the North Pole. And he was saying that the, the sun and the moon were birthed from the North Pole. They go up in the sky and then they do this spiral and they spiral out. And that something, you know, with the um with the, the there are ripples, if you were, going from the center outwards of, um, not glacial periods, uh, you know, um, global winters, if you will, and they ripple out and then the summers come. And then so the last round that we can see as a part of our world would be the Aztecs, the Incas. And and I guess the only reason I'm saying this is because like it, it kind of did what David Icke did. And that was... Mm paint a picture that almost felt like you were reading a sci-fi book. The only difference was he was drawing upon, you know, um, as many of the the factual elements of our history and who we are as he possibly could. It there was a romantic element to it. Um, I guess like, I kind of want to switch gears here and I want to ask, man, you've had a lot of people on your podcast. I want to know somebody who stands out to you as somebody who who said something that probably it it made you stretch. Be like, really, really, it made you stretch, and then you went down that rabbit hole and started realizing, like, holy shit, maybe, just maybe, who who would that have been out of all your guests? Um. Well, at first I was gonna say I had a guy on who said. The, whose conclusion was we all died in the year 2012. And then uh, <laughs> then you added a caveat that I actually went further into it and believe it. Oh. So I had to scratch that one out. But <laughs> probably the Electric Universe people, which would be, um, you know, Walt Thornhill, um, David Talbot, uh, the Thunderbolts Project. To mm-hmm. me, that was really mind blowing because 
it's a way to look at all the lies NASA has told and not go flat Earth. It's an alternative. And what I really like about their paradigm is they cert, certain ones certain ones go there, some don't. But they talk about Saturn being the original sun, the dark sun, and that we used to be within this giant envelope of Saturn, and we had a perpetual twilight, and there was no seasons. The whole world was like San Diego, <laughs> and you could grow anytime you wanted. Abundance was there, and this echo of a golden age. You know, if you talk to these people who are in the electric universe model, they think it was when we were in that configuration. They think if you look at a lot of cave drawings and these squiggles and things that people were drawing, even the old depictions of the dragon, like the Chinese dragon, they say that those are discharges in the sky, that these people were looking up in the sky day or night and seeing this like permanent lightning bolt out there. Wow. And they would just equate it to a dragon is something alive. People, I think, used to think that all biology was alive in some form. And so they would look at it. And that's how some of these myths got started. And it's really fascinating because the conventional model just says that everything is basically as it is and no changes occur except for maybe million year arcs. And wow. all, the electric universe says actually things can happen and change quite quickly. And when certain bodies get into each other's vortex, they discharge. And so the energy from the from Saturn, a, a, a dwarf, uh, uh, some it, they think Saturn was a star, obviously, or it wouldn't have been our sun, but a brown dwarf star, I believe. And mm -hmm. it can discharge really quickly when something else enters its purview. And I, I'm just really compelled by the stuff they talk about because it ties into why are there all these references to Saturn? What are the elite doing with all that? And it yeah. ties into Tesla technology and the ether and the fact that maybe electricity is just in the air and can be harnessed in many different ways. And maybe the ancient past was way different and Tartaria and all that stuff. It, it kind of folds in a lot. When you when you consider it, and it is also epic. So that's like what I like is it explains a lot. It pro provides this whole new paradigm, but it's also super mind blowing too. Yeah. So there's there's something that I love about what you're saying because th it doesn't matter how wacky it is sometimes. Like if if there's enough for you to be like, ooh, I have to look deeper into that, and then on top of that, the territory that you get to dance in allows for you to really just kind of stretch out and, and I don't know, perform some kind of cognitive gem gymnastics that you normally don't get to when you're, we, when we're stuck in our default mode. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to, I want to mention Stephanie Ramirez said, uh, um, 20% of NASA's budget is for space exploration, just 20%. Yeah. And, um, is pillows, right? Tempur yeah. <laughs> and then, um, I also noticed you had Joel Salatin on as your it was uh, the the episode right after mine, mm -hmm. and uh, Jeffrey Cummings asks, "What did Joel Salatin bring to you, Greg? Like, what what did you appreciate about um, what he was speaking about?" I just listened to it today; it was great. Well, thank you. Uh, well, you know, with conspiracy, not to make this a really long answer, but I think we wake up to a lot of stuff and we're like, "Well, we got to end this." We got to stop central banking. We got to fix this. We got to stop factory farming. We can't go on like this. You wake up to it and you want to end it. And then you realize, oh, uh, that's a little bit above my pay grade. I don't get to end anything. I can just navigate around it. And to me, that's a big part of Joel Salatin's work is that you're not going to stop factory farming. Why even protest about it and invest all this energy? In it? Just go get good quality, grass-fed, pasture-fed meat that is done sustainably. And it is, you know, a lot of people get really polarized about their dietary choices, but it is pretty clear that what the elite are pushing is this Franken meat, plant-based meat. I think that, you know, call me crazy, going out on a limb, but the vegetarian diet is somewhat of the poverty diet that they want to give us. I'm more in that primal diet kind of place. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think he's so great about is this is how meat should be handled. This is how this should all work. It's a 
sustainable ecosystem. They trample down the pastures. They go up. They alleviate, uh, relieve themselves. It comes down the mountain. It, it filters back in. It's a, it's a whole process. And that's like the kind of stuff I'm really into, the nature side of things, like the nature side of farming and permaculture and even Rudolf Steiner's like biodynamic agriculture. There's some weird yeah. stuff there. Uh, but I think the most interesting thing Joel said was, uh, he said, if you were trying, hypothetically, let's say there was a cabal out there that was trying to create the worst quality meat, the most pathogenically friendly farming available. And what then you would said, you hypothetically, of course. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Uh, but it's like, what would you do? Well, no sunlight, check. Cram them in there, overcrowded, check. You know, feed them things that aren't nat that aren't natural, check that box too. It's like everything you would do if you reverse engineer all the worst choices to give people the worst quality meat to make us sick. Generally, you know, weak and sick. That's what you would do. So I don't think we get to end factory farming, but we can highlight the people who are doing it better and just go directly to them. And shut up about it. You know, people who don't want to see it aren't going to see it. Go yeah. have your Tyson chicken. I don't care. You know, I got to live my life. There's only 100 years tops. Yeah. You know, I'm already one third done, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I really am sick of trying to wake people up who aren't interested in hearing it. Like, they got their own journey. I yeah. feel you, man. I feel Direct you. Action. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's that early in life thing where you're like, I can change the world and I'm gonna. Like, and yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it's a cool attribute to have that, but I definitely think over time you're like, you know what? There's only it's like a, a mystery school. Only a few who who show up are actually serious about it. Yeah. You know, the the rest are what you would call the exoteric. They they come to church on Sunday, but but they they leave church when they leave it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and like that's the what I loved about Joel Salatin was he was also saying like you the air that they're breathing is circulated fecal material yeah. and it's all year round there's no like seasons to it so the parasite cycles um are having a heyday they're flourishing inside yeah. these cows because there's there's never an off season for it um and yeah there you go Joel Salatin and um it's definitely true that you know like for to me the whole idea about like arguing for what people are going to eat. I, I agree when it comes to the death and the slaughter of countless animals that never really had a life to begin with. I, I always have this soft spot inside me, but I also look back to most, not all, but most spiritual traditions. They, they didn't. And some, you, you would see yogis going back very, very far eating a very simple plant-based diet, but they didn't just eat like soybeans and whatever's on the shelf, they right. were eating herbs outside of their cave in asceticism. It was completely different than modern day vegans or vegetarians. And I'm not knocking anyone, but like the, the thing that I appreciate about, and actually I think there's a necessity to the vegans and the vegetarians out there because they are speaking up to something that's not getting a voice because I can say for the most part, most people who are doing the meat-based diet, they don't have any relationship whatsoever to that animal. And nine times out of 10, that animal did not have uh, a natural life. I may, mm -hmm. I wouldn't go so far as to say they had a bad life because I don't really know, but they didn't have a natural life. So that's kind of the nuance of some of these conversations yeah. that are interesting. And it's, it's funny as a host, as you, you know, such as yourself, you have so many people and I mean, you could probably attest to this conspiracy theorists, especially the ones that will go on to a program and talk about what they know. They're really, really, you know, uh, avid readers. They are historians or they really, really know what they're talking about. But there are some of these blind spots. And then as a host, you got to kind of navigate that and then also push back a little bit. Um, who, if you if there is an example who do you feel like out of all the guests that you've had, regardless of like the tone um, between it, who do you feel like you had to push back against the most that you didn't, you, you just felt like, nah, I got, I gotta, I gotta push back against these ideas. Is there anyone? Mm, 
Well, there's a couple. The one that is top of mind is Dr. Stephen Greer. Uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, I had him on towards the beginning of COVID and he had been saying on podcasts, well, I know the truth about this, but I would never say it on your show because I don't want you to get deplatformed. And so okay. I came in hot with like, dude, I don't care about getting deplatformed. I want to know what you know. And he just kind of hemmed and hawed and said some pretty you know, mainstream stuff. And I, I just cut him off and was like, well, look, dude, you're supposed to be a doctor and you're supposed to be, you know, woke to the big conspiracy. What's how come you didn't mention PCR tests? How come you didn't mention this and that? And, you know, we've all been through it at this point. But then mm -hmm. he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. You're, it's just like, dude, you did not come correct with this at all. And I just felt like he's a bit of a phony. I shouldn't say that kind of thing. But it goes on to his bigger bread and butter, which is selling these uh, events in the desert where you contact UFOs, you call them in through meditation and stuff. I think it's probably a real thing, but I just have a lot of problems with these guys who say, well, the beans are right there. They want to help us, but we're not ready. And it's like, well, if these beans are so smart, they should realize that there's only about 500 people that craft the narrative for everyone else and that we're never going to get out of this if we don't dismantle the news organizations and the politicians and the World Health Organization and all these big cabals that people are following along to, like the Pied Piper. If we don't get rid of those in a pretty dramatic way, we're never going to graduate. So it's like some they, they're speaking out of two sides of their mouth and they're like, oh, well, once the energy hits this crescendo, the beans are going to sweep in and the Space Brothers are going to help us. And it's like, well, then they should already know that 90 percent of people are good and simple and, you know, aren't responsible for the factory farming and the fractional reserve banking system and the slave labor making T-shirts in Indonesia. It's not us. You know, we're not <laughs> yeah. trashing the planet the way these True. corporations are. So True. if these space brothers are so damn smart, they should just come in and be like, yeah, that is the top 1% that's fucking the rest of you. And we are going to help you out. So mm. I just don't like that perspective that they're always just right there, right around the edge. It's like the big savior motif. I also, push, I also push back against uh, libertarians as well, because I think that a lot of libertarian ideas sound good. And I'm a general libertarian but when we get to anarchism and they're just like well if we dismantle government everything will be okay it's like well i'm seeing corporations as a huge 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 problem and i'm yeah. seeing even our weak fractured government compromised government as the only check against that libertarians want to get rid of the minimum wage how do you think that's going to go everybody makes a dollar now if, if anything because people go to work at these corporations, they've already got monopolies on every industry. You think they're gonna pay you more because a free market demands it? We're dealing with that right now. So I think that if you get rid of governments, you're just gonna get warlords. You're just gonna get power that comes into this vacuum and it's gonna be a lot less stable than today's cabals. I mean, we can at least have some joy. I just yeah. think it's really naive to think that. Uh, I also yeah. it's just naive to think that we should get rid of government and everything will work out in the free market, just as the Space Brothers are being right there around the corner. Those are the issues that I tend to push back on the most because it's just it's just doesn't, doesn't seem rooted in reality to me. It's like all hypothetical and wishful thinking. It is pretty interesting. I started diving down the the rabbit hole of anarchism um, with uh, with a lot like of people, but I. Most recently looked into Michael Malice, and I saw an interview of him talking about it with um, Patrick Bet David, I think is his name, from yeah. Valuetainment, if you know who that is. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, they had a good conversation, and I actually like how Patrick pushed back uh, on some of these ideas, really just to get Michael going. And I thought I was actually going to agree with Michael a lot more. But also, like, I mean, he he's a brilliant man, and he also brought up some some really excellent points. 
and he was saying like the, the the current system doesn't protect you and and Patrick was like well you know what if somebody steals your car you know like who do you go to then and he's just like well you know right now you go to a service which is mandatory you have to go to the cops but then you could go to you could outsource it to another company and i was like i like that idea in principle but i i think it's actually not many people are organized enough to maybe they do have coverage maybe they don't uh, but i don't think it's organized enough to where it would go at the current state of of human intelligence and this is not a knock on us this is actually more towards your point that like we we haven't been given good conditions to even know what it's like to care for ourselves so if you were to just remove what what could be called the nanny state or like the, you know the the archetypal mom and dad of government if you were to just remove it maybe it could have some beautiful effects to it but i also think that it's we it's too much of a, a an adjustment there ha there would have to be some bridge towards it i'm really interested like have you had any guests on that have been talking about web3 or um like the metaverse and directions of like in a sense, democratizing government with the use of advancing exponential tech. Mm. Not so much. I mean, we're definitely tiptoeing into that area, uh, but it hasn't really been the highlight of anything yet. I guess I could say Alison McDowell. She talks about that quite a lot from a high level. Uh, Did you have her on your pod? Yeah, twice now. Oh, she's uh, great. Yeah, she really is. She really is. She's great at taking the stuff we're being sold, the blockchain technology, and showing how it is basically a roundabout Trojan horse of enslavement. And just like everything tends to be. But, you know, tools are tools, just like the internet. We have had quite a lot of success on the internet, and we've learned a lot from it. It's also a shackle around our ankle. And that's just yeah. the way life is. That's uh, this reality. It's uh, paradoxical in yeah, that way. But it's a little story about pretty... Estonia using they're kind of like a lot of people cite taiwan and estonia as good examples of using a more modern e-government to use sort of blockchain combined with digitizing democracy Interesting. so there's, there's small examples but people are trying to say you know america's not the same we're more header header you know larger in this but it's possible with the tech we have nowadays the problem is you know the wolf's guarding the hen house agreeing yeah, to yeah. these it's new so systemic much... changes it's so much about intention, you know, mm -hmm. our government does not have a good intention, but there are some small pockets of the world where people are actually uh, led by forward thinking people that want to try something new, like making Bitcoin their currency. It's yeah. it's time to, to do some throw some Hail Marys, I would say, because it's not well, was, good. I was talking to Ben right before the show started. You're starting to really, I feel looking at sort of the pulse of the internet and culture, the pendulum seems to be starting to swing back from all of this more repressive authoritative measures to where now you're seeing the massive trucker freedom rally in Canada. You're seeing massive, the great resignation of people leveraging the worker power with, you know, the management structure. So it seems like all of these things are coalescing to where the most, the biggest thing they are afraid of is the people coming together and uniting. And now, because they're being so aggressive, whether it's an end game, you know, swan song or what, they're being very aggressive with these measures. It's forcing them to be sloppy, and people are now realizing the charade. They're seeing the wizard and going, okay, wait, we can unite around some of these, we can agree to disagree on some small stuff. And that's what's beautiful. That's the most exciting to me, because that's really, if we get community on the left and right, populism, whatever you want to term it, um, you're seeing it. People are looking past the charades and. It's exciting, but yeah, this is just the beginning, but I'm, that gives me help seeing those kind of catalysts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really easy to focus on the negative stuff where we're in this ready player one world and everyone's yeah. just in this shitty poverty box and they put on their Oculus Rift and they get to be whoever they want to be. And that's the reality that they're trying to push us towards. I totally agree. But there is also some really hopeful opportunity out there and there are a lot of metaverse and blockchain web 3.0 projects that are trying to take back the internet and and re uh regrow that original spirit that we used to like so much and you know take it from someone who 
makes a living off of voluntary contribution. That's another one of my problems with the libertarian, free market, anarchist types is it's a nice idea that everybody's going to contribute, that everybody's just going to volunteer to fix the roads. But there will be people, many people that are like, I think the roads are fine. I'll navigate the potholes. Mm-hmm. And while the other people are frustrated with, well, we need to fix this. And like, ah, I'm OK. And it's like, yeah. so what, then what do you do? Because if taxation is theft, you can't force people to give their money up. And it's just the same thing of trickle down economics to me, this idea like, oh, if everybody had more money, then they would put it into the private police force and fixing the roads and building a better society. No, they won't. They just want another zero on the bank account, a lot of people. Mm. So I think it's it's just another weird thing that I get hung up on with those people. They make some good points, but I just don't think a lot of folks really volunteer their funds like it suggested that they would. No, yeah. no, you, I mean, you, you're definitely right. Yeah. You um, gotta, well, you gotta take for me just to put this little two cents really like how I approached it was trying to be very neutral coming out of college and really trying to reassess a lot of things and just trying to take the best from every little thing I could find. I would find libertarian things I would resonate with and, and say, Oh, I yeah. like that concept. But then I would see certain things that I disagree with. And that's what's hard for people, especially nowadays, where you have to be in one box, one compartment. Mm-hmm. It's hard to be like, well, can I have a certain libertarian value and also a certain quasi, you know, democratic socialist value? And it's like, no, you're only going to be this. And it's got to be only yeah. what this whole tribe believes. And that's where a lot of people feel disillusioned and going, well, I don't even know where, what I am anymore, you know, yeah. based on what this group says. So that's... I think the universal concepts is a good thing and kind of basing just your principle, what relies mess with your principle is how I approach it, but it's tricky. And I think it's, this is by design for it to be tricky, for it to be yes. this duopoly, to force you to go, no, only red or only blue. It's like, well, is this just like Coke or Pepsi? Is this really choice? Yeah, absolutely. I sometimes wonder if there's something esoteric about that too. People talk about this is a dualist reality right. and it just seems like, We can't ever get away from it. We always drift back into that, you're in or you're out type of thinking. And yes, it's cultivated from the top down and we're pitted against each other, left, right, black, white, all that stuff. But it also seems somewhat natural, like baked in to our reality, Mm -hmm. male, female. The elite didn't start that. You know, it just seems like it's the way it is. Spirit world, material world, two sides of every coin. But they definitely weaponize that mechanism against right. us in, in the worst ways. I think libertarianism is a good personal philosophy. Live and let live. Don't mess with anybody yeah. and do your own thing. But it just doesn't work as a top-down structure because right. people are just too varied. Right. Socially liberal. I think we have a big X factor about us that we can't even figure out. Like, we need <laughs> the left-right paradigms as archetypes to explain who we are to us. Like we yeah. need that mechanism, that social mirror, that hyperdimensional mirror that gives us many different ways to view ourselves. And if we don't have that, I mean, if you look back into history, all history used religion and mythology the same exact way to create right. these archetypes. There's the hero. You know, the the other end of the hero is the martyr, right? The one who dies for nothing instead of everything. The sinner. Um, there, there's hmm. these aspects of character that don't go away and you're right they definitely are um they're weaponized in many ways and it almost seems like we're not going to be given the answer we need to invent the answer there's something about this we, mm-hmm. like th- there's this aspect of being a conspiracy theorist that is so easy to fall into which is well none of my problems are mine they're all their problems they, you know it's yeah. always someone else's fault and that's what i like about what you've done and and also the way that you still let it ring through the way that you speak in your show is it's it's not like this like reason to to get buggy eyed and say we're all going to die sorry th- this this is the end you know like there's still a reason to even if the titanic is sinking those musicians still decided to do their job like what else are you going to do sit and shit your pants or focus your mind on the craft that you were born to bring to the world in your final moments and you know like that's you know i think that's a really powerful thing is these left right paradigm things we're looking to them to deliver us from them right we're looking at the mechanisms themselves to deliver us from the mechanisms when in fact we may have to invent these things ourselves and i've been wondering like 
I'm wondering how how many guests you've had that have brought up things like 5G and uh, you know just telecommunications infrastructure because yeah. I get so much pushback. Like I mean, from 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 you know places that you would imagine will be okay with talking about everything, and they're like, uh, just just so you know, the the one thing we're not going to talk about is 5G or oh, or vaccines here. nowadays. Now but it, it seems like even bigger 5G. It's like, oh wait a minute, you can go back to vaccines. Stop talking about 5G right now. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. I want I to know think... your thoughts. Did any has anyone gone balls deep on five G on your show? Oh yeah, yeah, many times. I don't think that five G is as polarizing as vaccines at all, but maybe it is. I mean, everybody's got a different trigger. Uh, I think what people should consider about five G is I recently had Robert F Kennedy Jr. on, and it was mostly about vaccines and COVID, but he has also sued the FCC for saying that 5G technology is safe to be around, and he won. Like, wow. that's a fact. So what that means to me is that they haven't proved that it's safe, not that it's unsafe, but they've been made all these claims, and he took them to court, like, prove this. Where's your data that suggests that it's totally safe to put up on, on a schoolyard? And they don't have anything. So he won. And that's a bullet point that I would hope makes people look at it more. But the 5G thing to me is really just, they have got all these smart devices and they need the smart devices to be able to talk to each other so that your whole house can be a surveillance jail cell. And mm. it requires 5G. They're not doing 5G so you can download Game of Thrones <laughs> faster. They're doing it so that they can build the prison infrastructure around you and I wouldn't be so quick to adopt it in any sort of way. It actually you know, bothers me quite a bit that I see these things popping up around my neighborhood and it's like, what, I have to move now? And like, where am I gonna go that I can guarantee this isn't gonna be a problem? You know, Mar-a-Lago. on the woods? Well, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Trump had Mar-a-Lago, like a, a, a radius around it. You cannot put 5G towers around, my, uh, around Mar-a-Lago. So it's interesting because as soon as he got into office, he was like, we need 5G and we need it faster than China. Yeah, he was big. But don't put it around my house. (laughs) And how often does that come up? You know, Steve Jobs didn't let his kids use the iPad. Exactly. You know, Bill Gates, uh, I've heard some things similarly. The guys making this technology, they know it's manipulative and they don't let their own families or children engage with it, yet they're selling it to you and yours. That's interesting. You know, Mm. something to think about. And just to go back to what you were saying, Ben, about uh, like you were really touching on this theme that I don't know where I picked up on it, but now I try to filter most episodes I'm going to do through the lens of we need to make this worldview serve us. Like we are kind of representing conspiracy opinions and alternative ways of being. And if you're fat and sloppy and screaming like Alex Jones to the veins popping out of your head, you don't seem like it's serving you very well. You know, and that's, if you're in a paranoid bubble, like that's the issue to me that I've always tried to, to, to go towards is like, well, if this is a better way of thinking, if this is closer to the truth, then, you know, it should look like it enriches your life and, and puts you in a better position than someone who's, paranoid, frustrate, you know, just the Alex Jones archetype. That's what I think mm-hmm. his role is. I mean, mm. I, if you watch him go on other shows like Pierce Morgan or The View, so The View, here's how the game works. The View decides, oh, we're going to get the alternative opinion so that we can say we've covered all angles. Who's the guy for that? Ding, ding, ding. It's Alex Jones, the one that's top of the heap, put in place for that. And then he comes on The View He screams, he shouts, he grumbles, his veins are popping out of his neck. And then the housewives across America look at that and they're like, yeah, I'm not getting into that stuff. I'm not going to research 9-11 and look at the capstone cabal, because if this is what you get out of that worldview, I'm just going to avoid it all because he seems crazy. And I wanted to talk about the same stuff without seeming crazy and just you know, that's kind of a, a guiding principle is this worldview should serve us. So let's look at the natural organic farmers and not just scream about reptilians. There's time for that. But how are we <laughs> going to improve our life? How are we going to use the knowledge that the system is fucked 
10 ways to Sunday and every single sector of society has corporate overlords spinning you off in a poor direction and serving you negative things. What are you going to do about that? How are you going to live a better life? And I'm obviously a, a hypocrite. I still drink. I haven't exercised in two years at least. And, you know, I don't <laughs> you look meditate great, as much. Oh, I've, I've been blessed to be just skinny. And, uh, you know, when you're 30, it's nice to be skinny. When you're in high school and college, it's not so great. But, you know, uh, all the guys who are in good shape, drinking their protein shakes, shakes are all fat now. So I think I win. Yeah, you you definitely won. And dude, you're <laughs> definitely right, man. We are representing. I and I I take this seriously, not just as a job where like, you know, we need to keep up reputation so we can stay at the at the top of our game. It literally is. Like we are representing something that gets looked down upon more than just about anything. Like you're yeah. a conspiracy theorist throughout time. There have been a lot of persecutions, but if you're against the the man or the machine, you're towards the bottom of the, you know, the the pecking order. And what I have always me personally loved about conspiracy is showing, no, 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 there's another way to look at this. There is a way to look at this where, okay, news, it knows exactly what part of the brain stem it wants to connect to, right? It, you know, it wants to connect to the amygdala and it wants to tantalize those fight or flight responses within us that cause us to like, well, tomorrow I have to come back because what if there's something even worse? I need to know about it. You know, mm -hmm. like it's the same thing, but how do you speak to that same part of the brainstem? For me, I try to give solutions at the end of every show, at the end of every documentary. I try to show how this isn't the worst thing that could happen. It's just simply another opportunity for us to wake up to things that we we've been incongruent about and and just start engaging a little bit more. And that's the one thing that I really do. I, I think, you know, Gordo and I were talking about you and Sam Tripoli as really having an amazing model that brings lightheartedness to the darkest areas. It's not avoiding the dark because you only want it to be in the light. No, you're, you're literally, you're giving a platform for some of the darkest stuff out there, but you just refuse to go to that defeated place within that most of the, unfortunately, Alex Jones is a great archetype there of the, you need to scream at people to wake them up. Like, nah, sometimes whispers cause them to lean in a little bit more. And I met Alex, you know, he's, he's cool and, you know, like chilling out in an RV for a little he's bit. A showman. You know, he's a little bit of a showman. Yeah. But I also, I also get it because I've, I've had it before, even on my waking infinity show, I've had it before where I'm talking about the same thing over and over again. And I'm wondering like, is it that people aren't getting it or is it that I'm falsely assuming that something more should happen when I, when I, speak about these topics. So yeah. like for me, at least I have a mechanism that allows for me to self observe and not just blame the outside world for not changing. Cause I reported on it a bunch of times. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I guess for you, you know, Greg, I'm, I'm really curious, like, have there been moments where you've really had to sit yourself down and say like, okay, I need a better way to approach this. Or did it just come naturally to you to kind of have that upbeat, way of, of going about it. Cause you didn't just go comedy and sprinkle in some conspiracy. Like Stephen Hughes is one of my favorites, but he's still, he's a comedian first, then a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. You went this direction. Have you ever had to have that sit down with yourself? Yeah. Was, I mean, what, even, what even my around? wife, well, even my wife sometimes has to talk me off the ledge. I'll come out <laughs> of certain interviews really down and be like, we have to move. We have to get a compound somewhere. We have to get away from the cities. And it happens. But I think generally for me, it is just tone. Like you said, tone is really important. We are presented this idea that you should avoid rabbit holes because you will get obsessed and it'll derail your life. And you'll be Jim Carrey and number 23. And... <laughs> You know, it can happen. I just try to avoid those pitfalls. And uh, maybe I'm broken inside because I've always been able to look at really dark stuff and just be like, huh, that probably is how it is. And it just doesn't really affect me all that much. I mean, some days it does. Sometimes I'm up in bed in a cold sweat thinking about human trafficking and like, how yeah. the hell can this still be going on? And thinking about the lives of people who get sucked into that and 
how can I keep my own daughter? Now I have a three month old daughter. I was hoping for a son because there's a lot less problems. But, uh, now I'm like, how, you know, good parents, regular folks have their kids get sucked into these things by being in the wrong back alley. And I don't know how to teach my kid about these things without really uh, freaking them out. You can't raise them in a bubble. But no. if, if they have to be educated, but it's also like you don't want to drill all this negativity into them and have them be afraid of everyone. But, True. you know, girls have have something that a lot of people want. I mean, little boys, too, I guess. But I would say uh, there's a really great Dave Chappelle bit where he talks about when he was young, he used to go to like these really hard places in Harlem and do comedy before he was old enough to get into a comedy club and like. He'd do it for, let's say, a group of gang members, and they give him five grand cash. And he's going home on the bus with five grand cash. And he realizes, holy shit, this is the first time I've ever had something that people want. And then he realized that uh, that's what it's like to uh, be a girl. You know, you always are carrying something that guys want. And that can be kind of kind of scary sometimes, you know, if, totally. if people want it that bad, they'll just take it from you. And I have so, a, a six year old daughter and uh, I experienced the same thing. Uh, I remember my, my friend, he was in a band, he's living out in LA now. Um, but he told me when I was having a girl, he was just like, Phew. you know, with a boy, you only have to worry about one dick. With yeah, a girl, you have to worry about any dick around her. <laughs> it's true. I think the best approach is really just raise them to respect themselves and see themselves as super valuable and yeah. then try to cultivate in them not to give too much of themselves away on the way up because we all make mistakes and, and stuff like that and have relationships that aren't healthy for us and fizzle out. It's just easier to be the guy on those side of the, those relationships. But I think if you just teach them to value themselves a lot and uh, avoid the real tryhards and the real douchebags out there, maybe yeah. they won't get sucked into it as much, but we're all young and we have our own journeys and we have to make mistakes. And you're going to have to let your kids make mistakes. And you know, people ask me about, are you going to raise them to be in conspiracy? And it's like, well, there's no avoiding what I do for work. But to me, it really doesn't have an impact unless you arrive at it. You have to yeah. kind of be in the matrix and then True. wake up to the alternative. So, I mean, I'm going to be there to guide a little bit, but I want her to kind of see this for herself a little bit. I mean, her yeah. name is Theory, so we got a good start <laughs> that she can't, isn't going to be able to avoid it. But, uh, yeah, it's, just, cool it's difficult like stuff. Well, Dude, my, wife's, my wife's name is Teresa, and mine's Gregory. So the first three letters of Teresa, the last three letters of Gregory make theory. And it's just very on brand on top of it. Synchronistic. Uh, it's yeah. weird. So we had to go with it. I love it, man. I love it. Um, you know, so like, man, th there was another joke I wanted to make about girls and boys, but I think I'll leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, dude, I, I really appreciate your time today. I want to, I want to wrap it up and I want to, um, maybe ask like a forward thinking question of you for your show. And then also um, what what's next for not just the higher side chats, but for you, like, what are you looking to build in this world? But part of that question is like, what would be the ideal number one guest you want to get on your show? If you, if you had the pick of the litter, like who would someone be that you would definitely want on your show? And then maybe think of like one question you would want to ask that person. Mm. Man, it's really hard to say because a lot of the people I would want to have on are people who wouldn't answer my questions. You know, I want the people <laughs> who really know some shit and yeah. they're usually the bad guys the and genius. they're not going to, yeah, they're not going to answer <laughs> my questions. I'd love to ask some, some pointed questions to Dick Cheney, but uh, I would say, <laughs> why did you shoot that man in the face? <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Why did he wrong. apologize to you? Yeah, I get it. I want to know Jeez. what was in that man sized safe in your office or who That's was in true. it. Mm. Um, yeah, who was in it? Or Jeffrey Epstein. So, bring him back. Probably one of, <laughs> one of George W. Bush's clones in there. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so it's, um, it's hard to say, but I, I think just 
someone that I, I want to have them on to have them present their perspective to people. There are people who have died, like Trevor James Constable would have been really high on my list. Uh, but Dr. Tom Cowan, I think he's really great at what he does. And he's very big on the heart not being a pump, that it is more like a hydraulic ram, that the key to health is the water in your body. I mean, mm. I've done shows about structured water and stuff. He's big on that in a health context. I've asked him and he turned me down, but he would be uh, pretty high up there. And John Levy is a guy who runs a YouTube channel. I think John Levy is his name. Sounds and right. he goes over the mud flood and alternative history. I've asked him and he also turned me down. Uh, Robert Seffer is another guy who doesn't do interviews, but he's got such compelling material about uh, kind of kind of the biblical side of aliens and sci-fi and the Anunnaki and that kind of stuff. Uh mm -hmm he just doesn't do interviews and people are always like, why won't you have him on? It's like, it ain't up to me. I've yeah. tried. I've tried. If, if someone can think of it, I've probably tried over the last 10 years to have him on. Um, but yeah, yeah. Th those are some of the people that I just can't seem to snag and Catherine Austin fits, you know, we've been pretty close to doing interviews before, but it also hasn't happened. I think she's really great in her expertise but how all the money and the black budgets work and yep. uh, her Solari report is really great at highlighting the best of breed in so many different areas. And I do learn about people um, from her. Uh, you, you talked about somebody, we were talking about the esoteric biology stuff. Yeah. I get more Ulrika into. Granocher was yes. somebody on her Solari report. Did you, did you see that video by the way? No, I'm. It's on my list. I gotta okay. check it out. But I want to go more in that direction for sure. There's so much cool stuff in there, and maybe you can help me out with some some names. I do have some from the last time we talked. There, I added them to my long list. It seems like I have this crazy long list of potential guests, and every interview I do, I end up with like writing from from Ben Joseph Stewart, and I'll just pepper in the ones that are mentioned. And every show leads to like three or four more potential things, and you know, it's just hard to get to sometimes, but that is the the subject matter that I think is most ripe for exploration. It's kind of like the electric universe of the body and health and it is the wild stuff that can be done, like the secret sciences of medicine that have been suppressed. Yeah, dude, th those are really, really sexy topics. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, dude, I'll, I'll do some digging and I'll find some, uh, I'll find some names in that territory that I think you would really dig. Um, last question, man. Like, you know, big, you know, big picture for you, and maybe it's something you don't want to divulge. I don't know, but like, what, uh, what would be like next in your? I'm gonna build this in the world. Is you know, mm -hmm. does it just stick with the higher side chats, or does the higher side chats grow and develop? What are your thoughts? Well, I've thought about writing a book, The Higher Side Guide to Life, and just kind of making it mostly transcripts of episodes. But that's boring. Everybody does that. As you know, we've talked about it off the air that I really had this vision of doing a roundtable show calling it like Greg Carlwood's inner circle and getting multiple guests who have like an 80% alignment in a big circle, like Bill Maher's old politically incorrect show and mm -hmm. just have these long form conversations where we can drink and smoke. And it would just be really great to get some of the guests that I have in the room together and be able to moderate that conversation in that way. Mm -hmm. It would be a lot of fun, but it just seems like so expensive to put together. And then how do you ever even recoup that? It seems like a vanity project, but recently I did make a website, HiresideMeetups.com, kind of a copycat of no agenda who did it first for sure. But you know, no one has a monopoly on meetups. Yeah. Um, and I made this website. So anyone who's a listener, I want to, I kind of want to connect people better because podcasts are a one-on-one -on -one solo experience. So, I made this site so anyone can make an event and find the others near them. And that's a beautiful thing. But this year or the next year, I think I really want to take a crazy road trip across the country and see all my friends in all these different cities and use the network of meetups to just make it all a business expense. Like my gas from here to Florida, it's on the company because... I mean, you know how the game is played when you have a company, you're always looking for business expenses and mine's a pretty lean business. So I pay a lot of stupid taxes, yeah. but it would be fun to be able to leverage this into just a traveling adventure. 
And as long as I, if I go to Austin to see a couple of buddies of mine from high school, as long as there's a meetup at night where we have some drinks with listeners, then that's why I'm there. <laughs> you know, it's all on the company. And I like that idea. I yeah. haven't been able to leverage that. And uh, it just seems fun to be able to go around and meet more people, like-minded people, connect more people in multiple cities, use this infrastructure that I've built that there's a lot of ways you can use a, a big nationwide audience. And I haven't really used it at all. I just kind of hermit up and, and live my life. But it would be fun to, to get out and really do it this year, especially with everything that's been going on. It's just like, I don't think I'm getting on a plane for a while. Not, I mean, not, it's just shaky. Like, I know a lot of people who've been on planes. I don't want to wear the mask, but I have Sophia Smallstorm's cheesecloth mask. You breathe through it just fine. It's just for show. But yeah. the issue is that I I know people have taken flights recently, and they don't get to where they're going till the next day. All kinds yeah. of crazy shit. It's just, I want to be in my car. I want the control, and I want to just travel the country, get out of here for a little while, and really do the network thing and, and meet a bunch of people and do the meetups. So that's kind of what I think would be cathartic for me at this moment. I think that's an awesome idea. Just, just to let you know, I do the same thing with my family and, and I, I write off because everywhere I go, I find some one to interview and some project to connect it to. And I do it with my entire family. And a lot of the times, like if I need to get an Airbnb, I make sure it's it's a nice one because I get to film in that Airbnb, and mm -hmm. you know, and then I also get to enjoy that Airbnb. Um, mm -hmm. And and that way, I get to drive across the country. We get to see it, and because I have three kids, two still in diapers, um, and and God never intended for all that screaming of children to be locked inside a tin box going eighty down a highway. Um, we get to stop whenever we want in that, you know, it's, it's a pretty cool gig. So I would highly recommend you do that. Definitely. Uh, let me know if, um, if you do that and if Nashville is a stop, I can also like point you in a couple other directions. Um, dude, you're sure. doing good work. We had, uh, we had, the next um, higher side meetup, by the way, is I was about to say, I think maybe this weekend, maybe tomorrow. I think tomorrow actually. Yeah. At the higher, uh, yeah, it's at a cider place. It's the Brewery second one meetup. on that list. Uh, Fire Ciders Brewer meetup. When is it? It's this tomorrow. At tomorrow. 7 p.m. tomorrow, yeah. Tailgate Brewery. It's, yeah. And I'll, I'll bring post all this my in, kids the, out. in the show description. <laughs> It'll be fun. I mean, they're going to be fans of yours, you know. If they listen to my show, they just heard you on there. It's fun That's to explore true. and see how many people show up. It seems like, from what I'm hearing, you know, San Diego's was bigger because I was personally there, but I'm hearing like seven to a dozen people are showing up at these which is good you don't want too many people you don't want to overcrowd a place and you want to be able to actually converse with people and if it gets too big then you can't really do that so it's nice little casual small meetups and synchronistic that nashville's the next one that's pretty cool and it's tomorrow man um yeah i think that might have to happen uh, but I was going to say like in the, in the chats, I got a lot of people saying like, thanks, you know, Greg for your work. Um, got quite a few people that heard of this podcast through you, through the one that I did on your podcast. So Damn. I really appreciate that. And, um, dude, I, I just really appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, I highly encourage you to keep, you know, following your intuition and, and just building what you're building organically because, there is something like beneath the surface, you know, maybe you're not even able to wrap your language around it, but you're, you're staying true to a thing and whatever that thing is, you got to keep doing it. Cause the, the audience, as you know, is not dumb. The audience can see straight through fluff. Yes. Um, so I really appreciate the work that you're doing, man. It's super fun to, to chat with you like this. And, um, yeah, man, if there's anything left that you want to like make the audience aware of that they can engage in, go ahead and let them know. Right on. Well, I mean, just the higher side chats is the big thing. Subscribe to the second hour if you like the first hour. I also sell T-shirts. That's kind of a vanity project because I've always liked T-shirts and T-shirt design. And so I don't really make a lot of money on the T-shirts. It's just a, a fun thing, but I do like them, the thehiresideclothing.com. And thanks for having me, man. I, I can't believe that uh, I now know the esoteric agenda guy because I'd have to go back to my 21 year old self in a rundown Columbia, Missouri mall working at the sunglass hut kiosk and be like, Hey, this documentary you keep playing on loop in your little cubicle here, 
You're going to know that guy. He's going to come on your show. He's going to know you. Uh, it's just what a whirlwind. I mean, it all comes down to being bold and, and taking some chances and don't let yourself be miserable. I was miserable in those jobs and there was no end in sight and you know, there's no end in sight. So throw a Hail Mary. Everybody has a passion. You don't have to have another conspiracy podcast. Believe me, we don't need more of them, <laughs> but you probably like something and you could get into it so much that you could teach other people how to do it. You could teach classes about it online. That makes it even easier because they just click the button and they take your course. It's pre-recorded. There's many ways to to leverage the tools we have now and be your own person and do your own thing. I think that's really the, even though conspiracy is the topic at hand, the real like under the surface current of the higher side chats is that here's this college dropout stoner who found a way to be really comfortable doing something that he loves to do. Yeah, dude, you have a quote on your website that says, be consistent enough to make progress towards your dreams and be flexible enough to make changes when it's not working. Don't settle. Mm. It gets better. Yeah. And dude, I mean, it, it rings true. I mean, this is this is not um, an easy path to take, but the rewards are are just incredible. And man, you're you're crushing it. You're definitely crushing it. And I hope I had some small part in rescuing you from Missouri. Um, <laughs> of course. Yeah. The Ozarks. Dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, this was such a, a, a great uh, honor of mine to have Greg Carwood on the uh, show. I've been following him for quite some time, knowing that I would eventually go on the show, but I had this big pocket where I never thought I would be a film, you know, ne never make a film make a uh, film again or, you know, like not even go into these topics again. So I have to, you know, thank COVID for that, you know, got me back on the, on the bandwagon. Thank you, Rona. Um, yeah, wouldn't let me off the hook, but uh, really appreciate it for the audience. I love you all. I really appreciate um, the conversation that I always see in the chat over here, how engaging it truly is to have you all back every single Monday for Waking Infinity News, every single Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern for the Ben Stewart podcast. You know, I do the acoustic things on Fridays, and this is just the beginning, and I do feel like... People like, you know, Greg and many other people that are pretty much pushing in the same direction that there's a bigger collective artistic revolution and a network that's going to bring about something that no one of us could have ever done alone. So thank you all for your time, for the, the time that you spend coming back here, checking in on these topics. And with that being said, I'll just catch you guys next time on the Ben Stewart podcast. 